it's, it's fascinating in that regard that we see those things. So let me begin. So the, the, you'll find these, I believe, on week four where I have a lot. I do not have any outline material for this that are there. I have, so you'll find it on repro A and repro B. A is men, male, and, and B is female. And so we'll look at that now. And it's, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, I don't think there's a lot. If anything, there's probably a little more complexity in the male than in the female, but not uh, not ex excessively so. And if we don't get this done, let's say by no later than you know by four o'clock, then we'll ju I'll just dictate off the rest and send it to you, so you don't have to be here. Now I will send you this final thing to do. And what I typically do, if you if, for those who have never visited my office, it's on the other in the main side of the building where. The micro stuff where the micro lab is, except where the offices are. On the right, there's a little table outside my office, and I put exam like scantrons there that you can grab. So I'll put a handful out probably Friday. Give me something to do. I will come in Friday morning. It's like the end. We're very happy. Are you doing the same thing on the online test with the microphone? Most likely. Don't even, I don't even like you. I mean, you're, of course you're begging. Money would work better. I didn't say. Money would work better. I'm, I'm awful. All right. So repro. Very straight. Okay. It's like a lot of the other systems. You have the primary organs, ovaries, testes. Everything else is an accessory structure. So what happens? The primary organs have really two jobs. They produce eggs or sperm. That interestingly is exocrine, meaning it follows a series of ducts or tubules. Their other functions are endocrine, indicating that in that's testosterone, estrogen, and progesterone. That's it in a nutshell. If we want to look at some of the similarities, yes. The, 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 obviously, their job is sperm and eggs, which are the gametes. You've had this a zillion times. Gametes, when they when fertilization becomes a zygote, then it begins to divide. So, a lot of I would think it would be a lecture function to took it to look at meiosis more closely and things like law of independent assortment and the crossover of chiasmata phenomena. The whole idea of meiosis is genetic diversity. The whole idea of mitosis is making the same cell over and over again. That's the take home point. So we are inherently, the diversity is part of it. And it's interesting, I always think, because my wife biologically with her first husband has five children who don't look the same, but you could tell they were, certainly the brothers, you could tell were brothers. And, and the one sister you could tell was, you know, certainly related in some way, shape or form. So all of this, sexual intercourse, copulation, the whole idea of fertilization, and the context, I think, to understand anything reproductive. And when I do it in repro phys, which I do with my advanced phys classes, the concept is it's all about what goes right. It's all about the concept is it's, the system is designed to fertilize an implant. If it doesn't, then there's something wrong with the system. My, it's not... I say this to every class. It's not my strongest system. It's not like bones. It's not like blood. It's not like the heart or digestive or any of the ones I know very, very well. This is my, my understanding of this is more about what goes wrong. Having, you know, being part of an infertile couple and not having had children biologically. Okay. So, and, and I don't worry about the terms like gestation is fairly well known. Uh, you'll, if you're in nursing, you'll learn about this when you do histories, grava and para. In other words, how many times, gra how many grava would be, how many times pregnant, para would be, how many times. It's an important number that we look at. Homologous or analogous structure, because we start until the presentation at about six weeks after, of, after fertilization, we basically start developing female on the SXY, I believe that's the name of the gene begins to masculinize those who are masculine. So, and the, so we have a lot of structures that are homologous. Testes and ovaries, penis and clitoris. 
And you'll see the illustrations underscore that. And obviously the hormonal production and all they do. I mean, suffice it to say, it's whether it's feminization or masculization, masculinization or appropriate growth and development, they're all part of that. Again, that's more to me fizz than anatomy. And there's a series of ducts, glands, and perhaps less important external than internal genitalia. In physiology, I underscore this. This is the very famous axis. It's all about, and it's odd, just a quick fizz note, where we see positive feedback more frequently is in female, in a number of areas. It's one of the oddball things. Not just the birth canal thing with oxytocin being there's some other areas that are associated with very brief things for ovulation or the onset of pregnancy that kind of work like positive feedback. It's interesting in that regard. This axis is all over the place. It's there for thyroid, a variety of things, calcium control. A lot of this has to do with the hypothalamus senses it, sends signals, releasing hormones particularly one called GnRH, which is growth, gonadotropin release hormone. And then the pituitary, is that's from the posterior pituitary, vis-a-vis the hypothalamus, to the pituitary for follicle stimulating eggs and sperm, follicles, luteinizing hormone, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. Inhibin is an interesting one that comes along from the same areas that plays a role. And when puberty becomes puberty, when we be, reach puberty, a little, little let the sensitivity to the inhibin diminishes it, and it starts up a series of cyclical events that begin, whether, whether it's onset of menstruation or the masculinization of the male, whatever starts that. It's, 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 it's a very interesting system, hard to understand sometimes. So here's the here are the different hormones, you remember these, what they do. Follicles, eggs and sperm, luteinizing, hormone production, GnRH, hypothalamus, and basically the trigger for those. It's sensitive to levels. So when our estrogen and testosterone or progesterone levels fall, we make GnRH. When they're high, when they're high, like during pregnancy, why don't we ovulate again? Because those levels are are high. What do birth controls do, birth control pills do? They artificially create that high. I don't know enough about them to speak to you about them, but at least in their original formulation, there were a lot of problems with blood clotting issues, things with the way they were formulated initially. There were a lot of problems and the long-term usage and the rebound effect of becoming more likely to be pregnant after you stop them, particularly to stop them. So there's all sorts of aspects of that. And if you're interested in that, though, there's a lot of information out there. And that's the axis. And this is the whole idea. Puberty, low levels are enough to suppress it. A puberty, it's less sensitive to by the inhibition of that. And all of a sudden, bang, it starts. And and you and if you go through this, you go through this. And if you're doing meiosis and learning about sister chromatids and where it's a to me, that's physiology. Is the egg the egg being arrested in what's called prophase one. And then when the egg is ovulated, it becomes arrested until fertilization in meiosis too. Is that stuff you did or will do possibly for a class? Am I talking a foreign language? What? Oh, you still do this. I digress. Ignore me, everybody. So and I'm not going into the crossing over, though it's fascinating, if you will. And hyploid and daploid, wait, wait, haploid and diploid. I had that reversed, of course. And all the different phases, we're not going to do again. You don't want to do them? I don't want to do them. Crossing over, love that. Okay, and, and there's wonderful illustrations for it. And all sorts of animations that you, you are free to watch if you wish. Aha, let's get on to the anatomy. The testes, we know. Testes descend in a structure called the spermatic cord. Very sensitive, particularly when someone is struck there or strains that area. 
very familiar with it. It descends through what's called under or in a, in a tunnel in the inguinal ligament. That's the ligament between the anterior superior spine of the ilium and roughly the pubic symphysis. Under that sort of area, there are several tunnels. Those tunnels have femoral artery, femoral vein, variety of nerves. It's extraordinarily sensitive. The reproductive organs in the male, with the aid of a structure that we used to talk about called the gubernaculum, descend or are pulled down, even though they are technically should be parts of the abdominal peritoneal cavity, they come down within this thing called the spermatic cord, which is rich in blood vessels and nerves, why it is so sensitive. The whole idea behind this is temperature control because the testes are much more likely to produce abundant and healthy sperm if there is a temperature gradient of two to three degrees Celsius. First thing they do for male infertility, if it's a male is wearing briefs, they tell them to wear boxers because it might, it doesn't allow, but the heat transmission is not, or the, the temperature gradient is not nearly effective. So it, 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 it's all there for you. you know, they produce the sperm and within them, they also produce the hormones, the testosterone, and it's delivered through a series of continuous, important word, duct-like structures. In the female, it's a discontinuity at the start. The biggest single difference is that the ovaries ovulate the egg into the abdominal peritoneal cavity. Although briefly, okay, very, very close to the opening of the uterine tubes or fallopian tubes, and they're brought into those tubular structures by fibrae, by fibrae and cilia, cilia action, creating little eddies and currents and mucus threads that pull them in. Doesn't always happen. That's a source of ectopic pregnancies. That's going in, going out. That's a source of disease from pelvic inflammatory disease. Which are very, for those in micro, we're going to talk about that starting as early as Friday about how disease can spread in the woman and become much more problematic in many ways called pelvic inflammatory disease. So staking with the male, it's continuous. The sperm are collected in a structure called the epididymis, where they mature over about three weeks and are able, and they're not necessarily modal, but they're getting close to being movable. And at the time of ejaculation, basically a series of rhythmic peristaltic-like smooth muscle action pushes them out relatively rapidly through the ductus deferens and eventually collected into a common structure that shared uh, and eventually joins the urethra called the ejaculatory duct, and they're ejaculated out through the urethra. That's it. There's three glandular structures that help. Seminal glands, where it gets its name, semen, about 70% of the ejaculant, play an important role in acid, and there's a lot of acid-base controls physiologically. They play an important role in providing certain nutrients. The prostate is the milky white kind of a contribution and also activates it. The only sperm are act, sperm utilize fructose for energy source, not necessarily glucose, but fructose. And lastly, the bobo urethral glands are really just lubricatory. That's it. Not terribly complex, a little more interesting anatomically. There's models up there somebody left out. So it starts here. The similarities between the two, a, the egg and the, and, the test, and the testes have a hard outer cover called the tunica albuginea, white. And it's surrounded by layers of basically serous mucosa-like material, okay, called tunica vaginalis. They are, so within here, if you could imagine, and we'll look inside, is where the seminephrous tubules are, which you are the term you need to know, which is where the cellular elements that make the sperm and other structures that either support it or help to move it along its way and even produce the hormonal elements that are part of it. They collect starting in the head area 
of this epididymis looks very similar all the way to the tail and they move out by this comparatively long structure known as the bass or ductus deferens, one on either side of the bladder as they cross sort of under the ureter. As you can see, there is a certain amount of widening that occurs here as we see this ejaculatory duct. That's where it gets its contribution from the seminal glands. They sort of jump together within the prostate and that's where, and the prostate is where the urethra exiting the seminiferous gland and the uh, ejaculatory structures, the sperm, kind of come together, pick up the prostatic secretions, and on their way out with the bulbo-urethral gland, providing a certain amount of lubrication to the journey that they have through the three areas of the penis. You have the prostatic area of the penis of the urethra. You have, that's the urethra, I should be saying the membranous area where it kind of goes, think of it from outside to inside or from inside to outside rather. And then the external, the elongated portion is the penile or spongy. Spongy is because we call this layer of interesting tissue that surrounds it, the cavernous the corpora spongiosum. It encases it in its erectile tissue that fills and, and as part of the rigidity, there are two other structures, one on either side, as you'll see with the illustration coming up. All of those contribute toward effectively the uh, erection and excitation phase. So voila. So here's the idea. They're outside the abdominal pelvic cavity near the root of the penis, three degrees lower, optimizing sperm compartments are divided. The names of the two muscles, I never know which is which, are called the dardos and the cremaster. Okay. And they're the muscles that are responsible for maintaining the position and whether or uh, other factors, like after a shower, after getting in a pool, will pull them up for heat. It's all a response to heat that changes them from distant to farther away that are there. For you Seinfeld fans, they did a very interesting one about this. That's a TV show from a number of years, 20 years ago. And you can watch all the re reruns. Obviously no Seinfeld fans here. No Curb Your Enthusiasm fans. I don't know where you're missing. What? Hey, thank you. Which is why I like him. It's all right. You guys just, you, you just, we just rewatched a, 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 a 1958 movie called North by Northwest, a Hitchcock movie. And he always does the same kind of idea. Very famous scene uh, on Mount Rushmore, another famous scene with a crop duster. Oh, it's just fabulous. So here we are. So you can see the abundance of blood vessels. The vastus deferens come up through the spermatic cord along with the nerves and the blood vessels. Testes are down here, work their way around. And, and so take, and again, the muscular structures, you can see them down here, dardos muscle and the cremaster muscle be more around this area. You want to think of it that way. Here are the tunics. The vaginalis is really just peritoneum as it is in the female. It's covered by that. And then there's a lot of these divisions called seminiferous tubules. And you don't have to know this passageway because they go into straight tubules and reedy testes and efferent ductules. And if they, just know that it goes from the seminiferous tubules into the epididymis and the portions thereof. And they're stored there until sufficient excitation and climax is reached and then they're ejaculated. The heat is dissipated by the venous plexus that surrounds it. And the spermatic cord is that important structure I talked about. Here it is. These are, these, and effectively it's continuous. All of these tiny tubules, I know it's a bad joke. I've been doing it for the last 20 years. I see this, I think one thing, ramen noodles. Your college students, college students and ramen noodles are, you know about ramen noodles, don't you, Sadie? Okay. Doesn't it look like that? 
Just don't put that in boiling water. Bad joke. I'm sorry. Forgive me. And so they come out of here and eventually make their way, which is just a continuous portion where they mature all the way up through here until eventually, once they're ejaculated, they make their way up. Voila. Cryptorchism, undescended testicle, an important contributing factor. Not so much the inflammatory, but this. So for young men, the most common cancer is testicular cancer. It is scary. It is typically not fatal. And whenever you think of Lance Armstrong as an athlete, he had this. And before he was start using all the performance enhancing techniques, he's a great athlete. And, and he, had, he, he had to stop for a while because he had metastatic disease into his brain still around today so there's a it's, it's got a good cure rate the stra- epididymis into the ductus deferens the ejaculatory duct where it kind of joins with the seminal gland and then eventually into the urethra again uh, you can see it's it, it's a long duct for something that's in a very small area that are there and again it takes about three weeks to produce it the vast deference that's about foot and a half in length all together, journeying up through the inguinal canal into the pelvic cavity, and then joining the seminal vesicle in the ejaculatory duct. Again, smooth muscle contractions, propel it along peristaltically. And when you hear about someone having a vasectomy, this is what they transect. Years ago, it was a, it's a comparatively simple procedure, uh, probably more easily done than having someone's tubes tied which are similar in that sense. It's very, very effective. And interestingly enough, very, very reversible. My wife has a younger son and daughter post her ex having a, having a vasectomy reversed. So there's ample evidence about that. The three parts that you should know about the urethra, the one in the prostate, the one in this membranous part, but it's really, I, you know, it's sort of the dividing line between in the interior and exterior, and then the spongy. So here, the cross section is the best way to look at that. The urethra is typically on is central but lower and surrounded by erectile tissue, and then the cavernosa are quite large on either side, and they engorge with stimulation with blood and particularly that interesting chemical that we've talked about a couple of times in physiology called nitric oxide. We have a lot, nitric oxide is a big player we understand a lot more about today. And it's a potent vasodilator. And when it's released there, the, the dilation does two things. It engorges those venous, their cavernous veins with blood, but it limits their ability to flow out and so for X amount of time, there's a degree of rigidity or erection. And so, yes, the copulatory organ, the external genitalia in the male, different than the female, scrotum and penis, the tip is known as the glands, the foreskin is known as the prepuce. Uh, nearly everybody you run into in this country is circumcised the vast majority. I think the number's higher than this. Other parts in the world, not. In some countries, and it's like in my faith, it's ritual. Eight days. It's when they do it. It's called a bris. Just, I didn't have any say so in that. I was eight days old. Just, just saying. Boy, think of that when you're eight days old. What the heaven's name are you doing, mom and dad? Who's this guy with the big beard? That's one of those jokes you have to be Jewish to appreciate. And here's the erectile tissue, etc., that are there filling with blood. And same illustration I had before. Perineum is an interesting term. It's important. It's in the same in the man and the woman. It's bounded by the pubic symphysis anteriorly, the ischial tuberosities on either side, and the coccyx tip of that bone that kind of curves and it creates a diamond shaped area we call the perineum and from that as you'll see all of these are structures are there so here's what it looks like in the male anatomically 
And again, when, we, when you talk about sexually transmitted or urinary tract disorders, why, when we see the female, why they're so much more prominent. Here you have a lot of separation between the ano and genital area. In the female, we're almost next to each other. And that's a problem. So pubic symphysis, coccyx, ischial tuberosities kind of create that area we call the perineum. The seminal gland, somewhat on the bladder surface. It's, and this is where you get the pH stuff when you do the physiology. Fructose, coagulating enzymes. There's a lot, a lot. That's designed to not let the sperm flow out. There are other enzymes that break down the mucus that's in the female. It's, it's all about this very interesting design to achieve fertilization. It's very, very interesting, the whole idea of reproductive phys. This is where when, you, when they do forensics and look for whether there's been the quote-unquote fluids you hear in all the crime shows, this is what they're talking about. And it, and it fluoresces ultraviolet. We use ultraviolet a lot. For an analyzing substance, blood, if you spray the right, something called luminol on it, it will also fluoresce. And that's why you can look to see if somebody's tried to clean it up and whether or not there's been, been, been a crime scene there. I love crime shows. I think I told you about it. There's one I've watched 26 seasons of from Great Britain called Silent Witness. It's great. My wife is sick and tired. Are we watching another crime show from England? Yes, dear. Prostate, a problem. Good news. Milky, slightly acidic fluid helps to activate the sperm. Plays a role, we don't know what. Okay, about a third of the volume, the seminal fluid is the other. The sperm are in immense numbers, but very little in the way of contribution to volume. They're tiny. Well, we read through glands, just mucus. Same illustration. Here's it. This is it, everybody. 50% of men age 50 have prostatic disease. I will be 72 on May 10th. Thank you, cards, letters, money. So last year in October, before you guys were, it was a year ago in October, before you matriculated here, I had prostate surgery for that and it was secondary mostly to bladder can it was not cancerous okay lots of problems associated with it and so there's a variety of medicines and i had something like this that was done with a laser and so we look for it the, the interesting things are back here if we get to it oh, i went past it i'm sorry is what it makes okay this it makes something called prostatic sensitive antigen the two ways we detect prostate cancer are a combination of two things. We monitor it, its progress, its presence, or its improvement or lack thereof by something called prostatic sensitive antigen in the bloodstream. It's very important during treatment. Or, And the other is a digital rectal exam that's done for men, typically annually or biannually, whatever it is. And you can see it's very, very common sort of the analogous to breast disease in women, okay? And it's, there's a lot of ways to treat it. You'll see that, say, people died of prostate cancer, usually if they ignore it. Normally, it, 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 it's, it, typically most people have it 10 or more years before they succumb. So here you can see the secretions, two to five, it's about half a teaspoon to a teaspoon in our terms, and look per milliliter. So average several hundred million sperm. And when you look at the physiology, well, half of them go the wrong way, if you're thinking about it. Most of them are destroyed by a variety of chemicals and other defensive mechanisms. Only a few hundred to thousand actually reach the destination fairly long uh, toward where the tubes originate, moving away from the uterus to actually be able to achieve fertilization. And again, alkalinity neutralizes the acidity of both the male urethra and the female vagina. So it's a lot of pH balancing that goes on. Prostaglandins, decreasing viscosity in the cervix, and mucus, relaxin, ATP, suppressing female immune response, bacteria, bacteriological or bactericidal agents, 
clotting factor so it doesn't leak out. We talked about before, etc. That's what you got. Not everything else here is fizz. Not doing it, not doing it, not doing it. Uh, I don't do the spermatogenesis one. That's meiosis. As you can, and, it, and it stays fairly constant. Once men reach puberty and sort of max out by about somewhere between, let's say, 13 to 16, it stays at a fairly high level of production until their 60s, 70s, and long. Supportive cells, sperm-making cells, contractile cells, and these interstitial endocrine cells of LATIC are where the production of testosterone, and in men, even some estrogen-like substances are produced, and that's all we're doing with that. Aren't you happy? And this is what, you know, kind of, we see the maturation from something when it eventually gets here, okay? This is about what it looks like when you're kind of getting into the spermatid. And then over that three week period, we develop this. The acrosome or the head has agents, particularly enzymes to break down the barrier of the egg. The head contains the genetic material. The mid piece and the tail are, mid piece is about generating ATP, utilizing it, and this is the flagellar motion, unlike bacteria, isn't helicopter light, doesn't spin, it's side to side whipping tail. The blood testes barrier, sperm cells are born at puberty. They are antigenically different. So just like the blood brain barrier, you have a barrier here. When in traumatic cases, if sperm are exposed to the bloodstream, your body attacks them immunologically. They're foreign. Infertility. Here's my take, and there's a lot of this. We're seeing an increase in it now. Sperm quality or quantity, one of the tests they do is do a sperm count and look for its motility. That's there. I had that done. Roughly. Ballpark. My, my first wife and I went to legendary doctors. The guy was considered the leading expert in the world to try to have a baby biological. He was at the University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Celso Ramon Garcia. And basically, here's what they told us. 60% of the time it involves female, 20% of the time is male, and 20% of the time we don't know. Simple as that. There are a lot of culprits that have played a role today in this. Just to let you, so we've been seeing it over time. It's, there's a lot of antibiotics, radiation, marijuana, now it's easily accessible. Alcohol use, not good. Defects in calcium channels, thermal related. I mean, all of these things can play a role. If you're interested in it, and hopefully you don't have a problem with this, that's the interesting chart. There seems to be a little during fertilization when the male develops a little bit after birth, which I'm not sure why there were reasons been established. And you can see once puberty, it basically stays high well past 60, 70 years old. That kind of thing. It takes about three years to get it right. And you all know what the secondary sex characteristics. I may or may not get through the last part. Are you with me? Hallelujah. It's one of those crazy days. Female. Less complicated anatomically. More, much more complicated physiologically. The distinction. The gonads themselves, everything else. Uterus, tubes, cervix, vagina, external genitalia. All accessory structures. So you have internal the duct system and the structures that are there, external, what they consider external sex organs. Classic illustration, it's antiverted, it tends over the bladder. So you can imagine during pregnancy, as a baby develops here, the kind of pressure it puts both posteriorly, rectally, and anteriorly on the bladder that are there. That's the normal. One of the big problems with people doing either self-induced or abortions. And one of the things that brought on Roe v. Wade, if you're interested historically, even though that's our views on that have changed significantly and the laws are changing, of course. 
is that there were people were doing going people who didn't know the anatomy and trying to put instruments in there and causing horrible damage gangrenous uterus imagine that so it was, it was you know there was there was a, a big deal about that so that that law came about in 1974. Now, I was 23 years old so we were we were all very sort of in tune with that if you will so you can see the structure nothing's descended the fallopian tubes and the little fingers called fimbriae overlap okay there's a widening area that's here you can see where the entry point is called the infundibulum and then usually fertilization is about in this area and it carries itself on either side of the uterus and enters there and the uterus is almost just a giant smooth muscle with a lining around it it's the layers in here particularly what's called the stratum functionalis functional layer that is shed during menstruation and you have the, the vagina the opening neck cervix so we call the uterine cervix into the uterus itself as you will see so paired structures almond shape not terribly large all of these ligaments are not like ligaments in bone they are ligaments in the sense they are layers of connective tissue that some of which are from growth and development some of which are just folds of peritoneum that have and we collect them with the ovarian and suspensory and the mesovarium and the broad ligament as you'll see them they support this structure they're so intimately associated when they are inflamed typically by an infection sexually transmitted infection that is ascended they cause broad inflammatory disease and inevitably and we go over this in micro all the time the complications are ectopic pregnancies dysfunctional ovaries meaning infertility and early hysterectomies none of which are good because if you have dysfunctional ovaries or early hysterectomies immediately there's insufficient estrogen and that's a big big risk factor for osteoporosis and that was my first wife because she had cystic ovarian disease and and we effectively became menopausal in the mid-30s so she was sorry they started our estrogen supplements early on it's very diminutive five feet tall all that stuff so there's a lot of it interestingly in physiology they'll point out the middle is blood vessels and nerves where the development of the egg is on the exterior not in the medulla but in the cortex so it starts they start to develop here increase in size and then eventually rupture around here and then the corpus luteum which left and you'll get to that in physiology which takes over which it basically functions as the role of the placenta in until the placenta forms in fertilization and implantation but only functions for about 10 days that's the part of the menstrual cycle is physiology so the ovaries are from the gonadal arteries like the testes are directly off the abdominal aorta the uterus the blood supply that occasions menstruation comes off the internal iliac the uterine arteries and eventually they make their way down to the uterus and form spiral arteries which go into spasm once that what we call the corpus luteum after 10 days stops making estrogen and progesterone mostly progesterone they spasm it causes the two layers in the uterus of lining cells to separate builds up a pressure head when the spasm releases the blood flow the fluid the pressure causes pressure. so again tunic albuginea and then a peritoneal layer the vaginalis here's the broad ligament i don't ask you to know the difference between any of these ligaments whether it's the ovarian ligament the broad ligament type and so it supports all the structures here's ovulation the and it goes directly into the abdominal peritoneal cavity and the one at 99.99 percent of the time goes into the ovaries and every so often it does not and an ectopic can occur there which conceivably could be viable ectopics are tubal pregnancies much more common in the case of disease but certainly problematic and then it works its way along 
fertilization about here. The uterus, this is called the fundus, the dome-shaped portion that you see above. Just like we talked about in the stomach, that dome-shaped portion is the fundus. And so, and typically the implantation is somewhere along the mid wall. So the cortex is where the gametes form, and the medulla blood vessels emerge. They're called follicles. That's the sac, they contain the egg. And one, there's multiple, there's about 450,000 distributed between roughly the two ovaries. A number of those are sort of pre-selected and then one typically is selected as is going to become and typically alternate sites that are there. Here's the absence of direct contact. I've said it about 10 times already. It's a talking point. Uterine or fallopian tubes to the uterus to the vagina. Oviducts, another term, not nearly as long as the vas deferens, only about four inches. That's about 10 centimeters, as you can see. Superior region of the uterus, the opening, ciliated, and fimbriated drape over it. Usually the fertilization occurs in that opening early on, okay? And eventually it reaches the isthmus where it narrows and goes into the uterus. It captures that oocyte that's been uh, that oocyte's been ovulated, and then moves along. Ciliated cells move it along. Non-ciliated cells nutrition. As so you can see it here, ectopic where it shouldn't be. PIT talked about it. just bad. I cannot tell you how much we saw of this, mostly from gonorrhea back when I was a resident in the, in the 1977, 78, 79. Every day, multiple cases. All right. The uterus, thick-walled, very muscular, very large. Okay. Its whole job is this. Receive, nourish, fertilize, and implant. Normally, it's antiverted. It retroverts during excitement stage because it and sort of creates like a tenting over the vagina to more readily receive the sperm. So, I mean, it's, it's well understood. It has a body, the bulk of it, the fundus, the dome, where it narrows inferiorly, okay, where it meets the cervix that projects into the vagina, and there's an openings or osses, internal or external, and glands that play a role in blocking mucus that is changed at mid-cycle by typically prostaglandins and other binders. The big player, we're doing this again in micro, HPV. Staggering. This is six years ago, these stats. 450,000 women worldwide, 30 to 50. Nearly all, the most frequent of all the cancers that are life-threatening and HPV. Certain strains of it, very, very difficult. Um, depends on your feeling about vaccines. I personally would recommend it. I realize there's a lot of interesting... I, I'm fairly sure my granddaughter had it when it became available. That's there. You only have a limited window until about age 26. After age 26, it's likely that if you've had sexual activity, you've been infected. And it applies to men and women. These cervical cancers are also penile cancers, as we'll discuss in micro. Half smear is about that. Sometimes the testing parameters change. I don't go crazy over that nor these ligaments that support the uterus or the pouches per se. Because you, you've seen these illustration prolapse, weakness in the pelvic floor, which is also of tissue or muscular, to the multiple pregnancies, uh, being overweight, certain predispositions. My mom had to have, in those days, they called it a bladder lift. Basically, basically the uterus was being lifted. My mother-in-law now, soon to be age 97, had this done in her 80s. They have a whole unit that does this in at uh, McGee. And some of you will train if you're in nursing at McGee. And so they have what's called a pelvic floor unit. Yeah. And so it, 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 it's a very interesting area. That, that really is specialization. The big player is the myometrium, the smooth muscle that has the ability to contract rhythmically. The critical piece anatomically for our purposes, the endometrium. It has 
an interesting simple columnar on top of a thick lamina propria that the egg burrows into and resides in for development. The basalis, always there, does not react to ovarian hormones. The functionalis grows, increases, becomes glandular. So it's, it's all about the fertilization. You'll see the transition. This is functional because you can see the glands that are there. This is well developed. If there, if there was not implantation here, it would slough. Where the slough, where the break occurs is here. That's because of the arteries, uterine arteries, they arch over, that's what arcuate means. They radiate, they become straight and they spiral through the basalis and into the functionalis. And this is where the spiral spasm and it's all related to typically mostly progesterone, but to some extent estrogen levels. So here's the illustration. Here's the spiral arteries in the basalis. Here's a very, very well-developed functionalis because the glandular structures. So they come in here, they arch, they radiate, they spiral, and they branch. Vagina, thin wall, probably three to four inches. Obviously the birth canal, menstrual flow between the bladder and rectum. The urethra runs parallel and now you can see the proximity. And yeah, fibroelastic by design. It's, it's designed because of the fibroelastic nature to be more resistant to trauma. And that's part of the reason why we saw that onset of HIV infections in the male, because the rectal mucosa is not so designed. So it would tear, and that tearing makes a boundary, and that's where it infectious disease. So when you're talking now about monkey pox and things, it's all from that. Some, some are things are designed for certain things, some are not. Whatever you make of it, what you will. Okay. The secretions, the acidity is the big player. Lactobacillus, lactobacillus, lactobacillus. That's there in abundance. It feeds on glycogen. Estrogen makes glycogen in that area. Lactobacillus create tons of lactic acid. Mucus is the barrier, pre-puberty, postmenopausal. Childbearing years, lactic acid, lactic acid. Okay. And again, you can see the structure, the proximity between the anus, the urethra, the vagina, and the related structures close together, more prone to infection. This is the abortion number that was there. We refer to this area as the vulva classically, the fatty area overlying the symphysis, the labia majora, which you distinguish from the menorah because of hair. These are analogous to the scrotum, okay? And so those structures, we have vestibular glands, like the bulbourethral glands, the clitoris, like the penis. There's a glands on that, just like there's a prepuce on, uh, of the clitoris, just like there's a prepuce on, on the penis itself etc. All of those things are there. And then you see the perineal area. So you can see the illustration from before the mons, the prepuce, the clitor itself. Now, take it away. We have a penile like structure, pubic symphysis, glandular structures, and you can see there not a whole lot of difference. Lastly, and we're almost we're effectively done mammary glands, men and women, mostly fatty tissue, except during pregnancy or lactation, where, or in, and in preparation of that at certain cyclical times, where breasts begin to enlarge, that's the glandular enlargement. Structures are there, it's a modified sweat gland, pigmented area, the areola or areola, suspensory ligaments, it overlies, famously the pectoralis major, milk is passed through the ducts, okay? Obviously, a non-nursing, non-pregnant, we don't see the development. And mostly the size is fatty. Somebody who loses a lot of weight, that my daughter would be a classic example of that, who lost a lot of weight. And, and then, interestingly enough, after that, had an augmentation of amyloplasty. Not that she's concerned about her appearance. Just You've seen her pictures. Again, let me say this for the last time. 
don't have children. Yeah, we just too late. Tragic. Thirteen percent of all most common malignancy, second most common cause of death after lung cancer. Epithelial cells in the ducts, highly metastatic, tremendous amount of nodes in the underarm area, lymph nodes. If it's in the breast, it's likely in the lymph nodes. And that's why they always do a lymph node dissection. On early onset menstruation, late menopause, no pregnancies early, no or short periods of breastfeeding, all of these. And it's interesting, 70% of women with breast cancer have no known risk factors. And then the genes, which are you surely know about being very important. I do not know what the guidelines are for mammography anymore. And my mom was always stressed out. You know, I never told her, because they always say, you know, she'd wait, but they took it. She was worried, she loved it when they came out and said, oh, you can go now, versus we need you to come back for an ultrasound, but she's scared. All that type of stuff, treatment varies. I don't want to go into it. And I think that's everything. All right, ladies and gentlemen, lecture material is done. The lab anatomy lecture material. We shall reach, return here and try to do a dissection. Wanted to get you out as quickly as you can.